Hey everyone, welcome to session 127 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. You know, as we discussed in the recent Inside Java series show, Applied Behavior Analysis has a long history of helping people improve their fitness, nutrition, and overall well-being. Well, in today's session, Brandon May joins me to delve into this history a little further, while at the same time highlighting some of the amazing research he's conducted in this area. I'll give you two quick examples, uh, one of which is a study he's done to teach college athletes to lift weights with more velocity, and another intervention in which he created a token economy to improve the health and well-being of group home residents. So whether you care about the topic of fitness or not, there are tons of great lessons in this show relative to applying applied behavior analysis in novel areas. So I encourage you to listen to it in its entirety, and we go down some pretty fun rabbit holes uh, that kind of spans the both uh, EAB and applied realm. So if you're into that sort of thing, I think you'll really enjoy the discussion. Brennan received his BA in Psych and Neuroscience from the University of Colorado and his Master's in Social Work and ABA from St. Louis University. Right now, he's trying to finish up his dissertation in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, all while raising five kids, running his business, Elite ABA, as well as supporting other behavioral agencies and programs where he lives. In our discussion, we talked about tons of articles, podcasts, and other resources. Uh, I've done my best to catalog them at length over at behavioralobservations.com, so you can go there. And I think I pretty much rounded everything up, but feel free to give me a shout if there's something I missed. Uh, today's podcast is sponsored by the 2020 New Hampshire ABBA Behavior Analysis Virtual Conference. You know, the 2020 event will be a great event. It features speakers like Solon De Forte, Deb Grosset, Bridget Taylor, Alyssa Wilson, Camille Kolu, and Emily Sandoz. New Hampshire ABBA also acknowledges that the pandemic has resulted in financial burdens on many practitioners, so they've decided to use a values-based registration fee. So this is all going down on September 26th, so I hope to see you there, at least virtually. So for more information, go to nhaba.net, and of course I'll have a link to this in today's show notes. The other sponsor for the show is Praxis Continuing Education and Training. They've got two great ACT and RFT classes coming up. Uh, One is called Understanding and Using Relational Frame Theory for Behavior Analysts, and that's taught by Dr. Siri Ming and Tom Sabo. And the second one is Acceptance and Commitment Therapy with Parents with Drs. Lisa Coyne and Evelyn Gould. These are live online courses where participants can ask questions, get real-time feedback, etc., right on the spot. So for more information, go to praxiscet.com forward slash B-O-P-O-D. And if you use the code observations, you'll save money at your registration. Again, that's praxiscet.com forward slash B-O-P-O-D. And then lastly, we are brought to you by HRIC Recruiting. Barb Voss has been placing BCBAs in permanent positions for about a decade. And she's been in the recruiting business more generally for 30 years. So when you work with Barb, you work directly with the owner of the company. There's no middleman involved. So you get a highly personalized and professional service. So if you're about to graduate or if you're looking for a career change or if you just really want to know if the grass is greener on the other side, head over to hricolorado.com and schedule your confidential chat right away. Okay, I think that's it for opening remarks. So without any further delay, please enjoy this fun episode with Brandon May. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Brandon May, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How you doing today? Hey, good, Matt. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the pleasure's mine. You know, I think we're both uh, home with uh, with children in the house, and uh, we'll <laughs> see how that goes. Maybe, maybe we'll get some unexpected uh, background noises or visitors or who who can predict what could possibly happen? So uh, yeah. So anyway, thanks for joining me. And um, you know, I there's so many things I want to get into. Um, 
uh, into it with you on um, some of the topics we have to talk about. But uh, let's just start off like we always do here and uh, tell me a little bit about your ABA origin story. How'd you discover it and what made you want to pursue it as a career? Yeah, so I got kids set up with snacks, so hopefully uh, they'll eat and be be busy for a few minutes. But that's we'll a, have to that's see. a great uh, strategy, right? <laughs> that that and YouTube, um, right? Yeah, whatever works. Um, we're all trying to get through this together. I think whatever way we can. So um, yeah, so I kind of came at this again. Like I've, I've heard a lot of your guests talk about, kind of through the side door to some extent, right? Where it's like you're kind of dabbling in a related field and just fall into behavior analysis to some extent. So. Um, I started working in after school programs and just found myself gradu- uh, uh, kind of like gravitating towards individuals that had challenging behaviors or difficult psychosocial situations. Um, and this was just like at the end of high school, going into my undergrad program and uh, just kind of really enjoyed working with the kids that everyone else found to be kind of pains or more difficult to work with. And, and those were the kids I liked the most. Um, and so I knew I kind of wanted to be in that general realm. I studied psychology in undergraduate, by undergraduate program, which was in uh, psychology and neuroscience at the University of Colorado Boulder. Mm-hmm. Um, really continued to enjoy doing that. And then when I graduated, I knew I wanted to do something in a, a field somewhat related, but maybe not exactly where I was at in terms of like a cognitive psychology, neuroscience area. And uh, kind of stumbled into social work. Uh, so I joined a master's in social work program and was working at an independent supported living facility for high functioning adults with developmental disabilities. Uh, my social work program was great. The job I was in was was really fantastic. I, I loved that uh, you could be kind of so involved with the individuals being in a, in a living environment, like you're so involved in every aspect of their day. Um, I really loved working with that group of adults and had a great boss and a great experience. And we had a, a research methods class that we had to uh, present a, a proposal for a research project. Um, and so I, I, again, working at this ISL and, and going to school at the same time, I, I was noticing that a large portion of uh, the residents I was working with were overweight or obese, and that the strategies uh, that people were using to, to work with these individuals were pretty punitive, right? So it was a lot of like, shaming them for eating the wrong things or trying to guilt them into exercise. And I just thought like there has to be a better way to do this. And so I, in this research methods class, started looking at what's a more positive approach. I stumbled across token economies uh, in behavior analysis literature and thought, oh, it'd be cool to implement something like this in target weight loss and target these like more exercise and nutrition specific behaviors, uh, proposed that to my research methods class, and we actually chose my project to implement. And so we started that in that research methods class, and then um, that was in 2011, probably. And and that token program is still going at the ISL today, even though I'm not involved with it. So we had a lot of really cool success with it. Uh, The residents seemed to really enjoy a more positive approach. And uh, it kind of, again, gave me this entry into behavior analysis and to applying behavior analysis to, uh, you know, behaviors specifically targeting health and well-being. So, um, again, I kind of came in it from a, a non-traditional route, and then oh, the next oh, can, semester... Can, ahead, I, yeah. can I just pause you there for a second? Because I, I, I'm sure listeners are going to want to know, can you... I probably don't have time to get into all the details, but, you know, so it sounds like if the this this living setting is still using this program, it must be successful. And so I, I have two questions related to that. One is, uh, I know working particularly with adults, there's a lot of ethical considerations about, you know, what their, you know, uh, I guess in terms of their, their rights and things like that, to eat what they want. You know, there's that famous paper of, uh, you know, what's it, the right to eat donuts and sleep till four. I can't, I might, mm-hmm. I'm probably uh, citing it incorrectly in, in here, but uh, so I have questions about how you, how, how you threaded that needle, but uh, in broad strokes, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the system? Because I'm sure there's going to be lots of people saying, ooh, I want to know more about that. Sure, yeah. And um, we actually will have a couple papers coming out on this uh, in the next few months, I hope. Um, but uh, the, the, we started with the pilot was basically we provided tokens for, to residents just for wearing pedometers. Um, and I, I guess, first of all, to, to your ethical question, um, it was a voluntary program. Anyone was invited, so it was a the group home is includes sixteen total residents, and <clears throat> so it was a, it was a voluntary program, and I think fifteen of the sixteen participated consistently. All of them participated to some extent, and the selling point was just like 
you can do whatever you normally do, or you can be involved in this token program where we set goals together and you earn this extra stuff. Um, and so that was, I mean, if the opportunity presents itself to access more reinforcement, a lot of our people are going to choose to access more reinforcement. And so it was, there was no ethical concern that we were not setting goals without, you know, that we thought they needed and they weren't involved in. Um, and again, they got extra good stuff for it. So they were, they were pretty interested in doing that. Um, the, the beginning of the program, we, we were just trying to target, can we get residents to wear pedometers? And for most of them, we did. Um, and that was kind of like our baseline where we were just reinforcing pedometer adherence. Uh, the next phase was we were uh, setting individual goals, like daily goals and then weekly goals for steps with the residents. And we saw nice improvements in uh, pedometer uh, numbers, basically increased steps. Um, and then we thought like that's that's interesting. We're, we're seeing some, uh, some nice adherence to the program, but we might actually want to target <clears throat> actual exercise rather than just steps on a, using a pedometer. And so we started working with residents where they would be uh, earning tokens for um, increasing 30-minute exercise sessions, for increasing water consumption at dinner, for uh, eating a specific number of fruits and vegetables, so some, uh, we did one where they we tried to decrease the pace at which they were eating. So we had some pretty specific and individualized goals, as well as uh, some pretty more kind of like a, a an independent group contingency where anyone that, that exercised for 30 minutes got a token. Um, and then those tokens were exchanged generally at like a, a once a, me- a once a week uh, house meeting where they would sit down and, and we had a menu of reinforcers that they helped develop that included things like uh, gift cards to healthy restaurants. Um, <clears throat> healthy snacks, um, one-on-one time with individual staff members, uh, so it, they could uh, they could use tokens to to choose an outfit for me to wear to work that that week. So we try to be pretty creative. So oh, that's that, funny. Uh, yeah, so the, the, I know you know sometimes the cost prohibitive interventions can can make it difficult for independent supported living environments, and so we tried to be pretty creative with what they could use their tokens. Did for. anyone make you wear you know something? Uh something silly or unusual for, for, uh, you know, just for, for some giggles. Yeah. I had, I think I had to wear a dress for a portion of the day at one point. Um, and more people talked about doing it than actually did it. But, um, yeah, it was, it was out there. It was on the menu. So that they oh could my gosh. that. That's funny. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was pretty good. It was successful. And again, like, I think the key was that they were involved in the process and it was all reinforcement based, you know, there was no removing tokens. There was no, Again, the environment had been created previously that was really pretty punitive for them. And so to move to a system that was, hey, like do what you normally do and your life's the same, or here are these tokens that you can use for extra stuff if you want to improve your your physical fitness. Um, I think that, that was very appealing to them and was successful for them. Yeah, and it sounded just more con- on a conceptual level. It was additive, you know, uh, more than anything else. So that's that's pretty cool. Hey, I know I mentioned this at the beginning of the episode, just in case you skipped ahead. Uh, which, uh, personally, I wouldn't judge. Uh, I want to let you know that New Hampshire ABBA has an awesome virtual conference coming up. Yes, it's virtual, and that means that uh, we can stay safe, and just about anyone in the world can attend if they want to. There's an amazing speaker roster, uh, all female. It's uh, Dr. Solande Forte, Deb Grossett, Bridget Taylor, Alyssa Wilson, Camille Kolu, and Emily Sandoz. Uh, there's also a kind of values-based registration fee. So New Hampshire ABBA recognizes that the pandemic has hit uh, some number of behavior analysts pretty hard financially. And so there's a there's some variable pricing uh, available, and uh, it's just going to be a great event. Uh, again, it's September 26th. It's virtual. NHABA.net is where you can learn more information, or just go to behavioralobservations.com. I hope to virtually see you there. Thanks for checking it out. Well, I interrupted your 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 kind of uh, uh, I guess career arc. So uh, no. so you started uh, this this program. It was successful, and you kind of moved on from there. And so uh, uh, yeah. So then I yeah then I started, I've worked in a, a couple different um, uh, places where I was doing more traditional behavior analysis, working with individuals with autism and developmental disabilities on you know more of your skill acquisition and behavior reduction yeah. side. Um, currently I am employed as a full-time employee at the school of medicine at Washington university in St. Louis in the child psychiatry department. And, um, so when I, when I work at my clinic at WashU, we're mostly using, um, implementing a 
an early intervention program, kind of like in the, the early start Denver model, pivotal response training um, realm, specifically for uh, African-American children under the age of three. So the research says that African-American children are uh, twice as likely to develop a cognitive or intellectual disability. Um, and the the thesis is that a lot of that, in St. Louis at least, is a lack of access to early intervention supports. Um, and so one of, one of the things we're doing is trying to provide access to, to quality therapy early on for these children and see what kind of impact that might have. Um, so that's one program I'm working on. Is this part uh, of like I, a randomized control trial uh, uh, not research endeavor? Point, right? Yeah, right now it's, uh, it is attached to a research endeavor. So we um, are involved with a program called ACE, which is looking at um, kind of a lot of the demographic information regarding this group of children. And we're just taking kind of a subset of them and, and piloting to see, like, can we move the needle on um, adaptive behavior, language communication, and cognitive intellectual ability. So um, again, I think this will be a theme throughout this. A lot of these projects were in a good place and then interrupted in March by COVID. Sure. Um, but but we're, we're working virtually and seeing what we can do with, with a lot of those families um, for the ones that are able to to access virtual therapy, that can be a challenge too. Um, so that's part of my time. I contract part of my time with an agency called Great Circle, which provides kind of all-encompassing residential uh, school-based supports for individuals with autism and developmental disability. Uh, and I, my role there is to supervise the RBTs and some practicum students. Um, and then I'm on what are called ECHO projects. Have you? Do you know anything about ECHO as a model? So. The idea behind ECHO, it, it came out of the University of New Mexico, and the premise behind it is uh, moving knowledge, not people. So the idea is that it's a telehealth-based teaching approach uh, where you can get an expert, multidisciplinary expert team together um, in a specific kind of specialty area and teach more generalist providers how to implement strategies. So you're trying to really get the information from the, the people that have experience in really niche areas out to the more general public. And so we have a group of, you know, five or six of us that include behavior analysts and psychiatrists and uh, pharmacists and uh, apparent advocates. And we are all on kind of a hub team that I lead. And we work with, uh, we present kind of a short didactic and then have participants who join in from throughout the state that present cases to us. And we kind of talk them through, um, you know, have you tried, have you thought about this medication or have you tried this behaviorally based strategy? And, um, just kind of try to get that information out to them as best we can. Um, so that's mostly what I do a great circle at this point. Mm -hmm. And then I have a private practice where we serve individuals with autism and developmental disabilities in a variety of settings, but um, I think mostly relevant to this um, this conversation, we do provide kind of a specialty uh, exercise and nutrition program where um, you know we really try to get uh, individuals with autism and developmental disabilities to use uh, wearable devices to, to get to gather some data on things like heart rate and biometric data uh, to get information on their steps um, to log food into my fitness pal or some form of a, a food diary and app so we can look at tracking nutrition over time and then we implement strategies to try to improve um, health and wellness for these individuals and we've done some some interesting stuff with you know stimulus equivalents to teach them how to uh, learn new exercise programs or to, to figure out uh, information about nutrition and, and those kind of things. So that's been a pretty interesting and effective program there. Um, and then I am a finishing up my PhD at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Um, so I will finish my dissertation in December and be done and out of there and uh, a PhD, which I'm really excited about. So I think that was a long origin story, but that, that that's where I'm at and where I'm from. Well, I'm kind of, you know, I'm 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 now concerned about your sleep, uh, given that it sounds like you have 18 jobs. So, uh, but that's <laughs> sounds like you're getting quite a bit of experience um, at the same time. So, yeah, for sure. And I I have uh, my Whoop strap, so it, it collects data for me to tell me if my sleep is really bad, and I I'm going to be cranky that that day, or if I'm going to be uh, in a good place to to perform. But um, do you like the Whoop yeah, strap? I mean, I've seen uh, ads for it, and uh, I, I know that I, I I haven't gone down the wearable route just in my own uh, activities and things like that. Uh, and uh, I mean, I do, I do, when I ride a bike, I have like a, a heart rate monitor that's a, mm -hmm. essentially a chest strap. It's like you kind know, of ancient technology as a, mm -hmm. compared to what's out there these days. Yeah. So I love it. I mean, I, I use it 
partly for my workout. So it'll it'll calculate a lot of things like your your heart rate variability during sleep, uh, how much sleep you got, and, and like what stage of sleep you were in, whether that's light sleep or REM sleep or deep sleep. Um, and it'll calculate basically how how recovered you are for the next day. And then whenever you go to do your workouts, like if you were going out to ride your bike, it would provide some information about how hard should I push it today. Um, and, and, and it will then calculate as you're actually exercising how close you are to meeting that threshold. And so I love that it will push me when I feel a little bit lazy and don't want to work out quite as hard. It'll tell me like, hey, you're, you're ready for this. Um, and it also will, will pull me back a little bit if I'm feeling a little aggressive and um, know that if, if I do push it harder, it'll uh, hurt me the next day. So I, I really like it for a lot of reasons. And I think it gives me a lot of context for um, the way I exercise and the way I work the next day. So I, I think it's cool. All right. Very good. Um, that's the free plug for Whoop. Uh, so uh, I guess <laughs> they're, they're not a sponsor. Huh? They're not a not a sponsor of the show. Um, however, I am not open yet. to uh, I am open to all offers on that. But uh, yeah, all, all kidding aside, <laughs> yeah. The next one's uh, this uh, this one's on the house. The next one we'll see. No, uh, um, all kidding aside. So yeah, so we're talking about the the general topic of behavioral sports psychology, and you know. Um, uh, you know, long t- long time listeners will, will recall that you know Matt Norman's been on the show a couple times talking about uh, his work in this area. I've had uh, Dr. Nick Green on uh, and some um, uh, and the, uh, the the Kirby's from uh, Team ABA. And so this is not a new topic to uh, behavior analysis, uh, but the term behavioral sports psychology, which is a term that you share with me, uh, I guess is new. Uh, and so I I would love to give your take on what that means and and how it might differ from the general term sports psychology you know that i think gets thrown around a lot especially in the context of you know maybe some star athletes seeing a quote unquote sports psychologist or something along those lines and you know it, it, feel free to kind of sprinkle in any you know kind of uh, previous work in aba in this in this realm that that you you've found uh, helpful in, in, in your formulation of, of what it means to be a behavioral sports psychologist. Yeah. So I, and I, I listened to, I think all of those podcasts, um, I've read a lot of Matt's work specifically, I think in terms of like looking at exercise in this field, he's probably, uh, you know, definitely one of the top couple people and has a lot of great research out there. Um, and I, again, I, I know the Kirby's are doing something more in sports specific. And so I think what I've tried to do is looking at um, including exercise in this broad umbrella of behavioral sports psychology, but kind of more of a, of a research focus also. Um, as far as kind of differentiating behavioral sports psychology from sports psychology as a traditional kind of approach and um, kind of encompassing that within behavior analysis, it's, it's basically looking at the application of behavioral principles to sports performance, right? So that's a a pretty broad definition. Um, Specifically, what it's looking at is like, how do we operationally define target behavior? So that doesn't necessarily get accomplished quite as often in in traditional sports psychology, where it's, we're really going to clearly and operationally define a target behavior and measure its progress over time. And that's something that's uh, a key and essential feature of behavioral sports psychology. Uh, It's really focusing on uh, modifying antecedent and consequence variables. So again, looking at operant principles and how those influence uh, sports performance. It looks at both contingency only applications. So again, more your traditional operant approach to behavior analysis, but also looks at like those second and third wave interventions. So it includes things like cognitive behavior therapy and ACT, uh, which I, I know you've had a lot of ACT people on the podcast too. Sure. So we can definitely talk about that some as well. Um, one of the key features of behavioral sports psychology is it relies on single subject design, which is obviously a key tenet of behavior analysis and actually fits really well within the sports psychology uh, and sports performance umbrella. Um, because a lot of times what you're looking at when you're working with athletes is how do we improve this specific athlete's performance over time, right? Whereas your your group designs or your more um, – kind of like just broad strokes, here's a, 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 a just a generalized treatment approach, might not do that. And so what we're looking at is how do we take athlete A, measure his performance, implement an intervention, and see how that changes over time. Um, and then the, the fifth and final kind of uh, element of behavioral sports psychology is social validity, which, um, you know, is, is important to understand, you know, that we're, we're moving target behaviors to a socially significant degree and that, you um, 
the athletes find them acceptable, right? So it's, it's again, not a punitive approach. It's a much more reinforcement-based approach. Um, and the research is, is pretty solid in looking at behavioral sports psychology as a method for working with athletic performance over time. Okay, I just want to jump in here real quick. In case you miss it, at the beginning of the show, my friends at Praxis Continuing Education and Training have two great ACT and RFD classes coming up. Understanding and Using Relational Frame Theory for Behavior Analysts with Dr. Siri Ming and Tom Sabo. And Acceptance and Commitment Therapy with Parents with Drs. Lisa Coyne and Evelyn Gould. If these sound interesting to you, go to praxiscet.com forward slash B-O-P-O-D or go to the show notes for this episode. And if you decide to enroll, use the code OBSERVATIONS to save some money at registration. These are live, synchronous online classes where you can get direct questions answered and all the things that go along with that. Uh, it's a very unique, these are very, very unique events. So if you want to check it out again, go to behavioralobservations.com and look up session 127 or go to praxiscet.com forward slash B O P O D. All right, let's get back to Brandon. You know, I, uh, trying to just solve my own kind of fitness challenges and whatnot, I've heard of different, you know, I just, the, the, what I'm keying on here is the research design, the differentiation between groups and single subject designs here. And I, I, I wonder if the, uh, the traditional kind of exercise science community, uh, you know, they would certainly benefit from a single subject approach. You know, sometimes I'll hear a study and it's like, you know, they've got, you know, uh, uh, three groups of 10 people and, you know, they're, they're, you know, this kind of multifactorial, you know, analysis going on and things like that. And, you know, whereas if you, you know, comparing like may, might be high intensity interval training or some other type of, you know, uh, exercise program and whatnot. And every time I, I hear about one of those studies, I'm like, gosh, I wish it was, it would be so cool if they did either like a reversal or multiple baseline or something like that. And, and to demonstrate the power of specific progress, on an individual basis. Um, I don't know if you've, you've had those, those uh, uh, observations yourself, but it's one of those things that seems like the exercise science world is, uh, you know, pretty much wedded to groups design. And again, I'm, I'm probably largely ignorant of, of, you know, a, a lot of what they do, but just some of those things that kind of filter to my level. Yeah. That seems to be so the case. I, I mean, I think one thing is, so behavioral sports psychology started in, in the sixties and then we had the first publication in 72, which was a book that outlined operant procedures uh, and the use of uh, sports specifically. 74 was the first article in Java um, that looked at sports-specific interventions. And since then, we've actually seen a, a pretty substantial increase in single-subject design specific to sports um, from like the, the late 70s to the early 2000s. We were seeing like 17 to 20 articles published a year, which isn't a huge number, but it's um, pretty significant growth. And it was actually uh, more growth than we saw in more traditional sports psychology approaches. So um, there has been more of an adaptation in using that design um, in, in the sciences. But I, I do agree that in general, um, what group designs look at, obviously, is like, what's the average, what's going to happen for the average person, right? So it's, it's trying to give you some sort of a, a like, uh, just a benchmark for if you do this, this could happen to the average person. I, I think there is value in that too. It's just a matter mm-hmm. of um, trying to again, what it, what is the what is your pragmatic goal here? What is what are you trying to get out of this? And so I, I think uh, what I've tried to do with some of the work we'll talk about later is combine having some group design interventions included um, so that you can get some of that information. I think it's important to as behavior analysts to not get pigeonholed in just behavior analysis, but to expand that and say like, hey, our our science can be beneficial to other um, a- approaches as well. Um, and so I'd love to get some publications out into more traditional exercise science journals. And so I think that group design can be important for doing that. Well, um, you're, but, you're showing the influence of your major professor here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Mark, so I, I, when I work at, with Mark Dixon at, at Carbondale, obviously he's you know, kind of, it really emphasizes the importance of dissemination of the science and and making sure that it's available to large groups of people, and and that's how you're going to see the the most change. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's that kind of stuff is important, and um, I think combining that with the single subject design gives you more 
precision and, and a more of an ability to uh, tailor your approach to the at the individual level too. So I, I think using both of those approaches to, to your design can be really nice. Cool. So you, you've kind of teased us with referencing your research here and there. So let's let's get into it. I know you've done uh, some stuff with uh, Division One athletes and uh, all and all sorts of other things. So uh, I'll, I'll let you decide where where you'd like to start. But I know you've done a lot of cool things. So uh, have at it. I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So um, I mean, I, I guess I kind of I was in a place where I was feeling like I'd done. I worked in behavior analysis for a a while with individuals with autism. I had kind of dabbled in working with individuals with exercise and nutrition. um, And I I, I loved that. But I also started thinking, like, what am I doing with all my free time? Right. And and I what I was doing with my free time, other than playing with my five kids and enjoying time with my wife, was um, watching and playing sports. Right. So sports have always been a big part of my life. Uh, Everybody else was watching cartoons and I was watching Sports Center growing up. And like the, that's how I communicated with my dad and my brother was we were all together focusing on the Cardinals or on the Rams when they were in St. Louis or some form of, of sports. And so that was just always held kind of a, a special place in my heart. And, and I knew that, that if I could have some involvement in sports as part of my career, that that would lead for more reinforcing opportunities for me, I would, I would potentially be happier. And so, um, I, a couple of years ago, just started reaching out to uh, local universities to see if if they would be interested in working with a behavior analyst to um, improve their athletic department. Um, maybe I didn't phrase it as improving their athletic department, but if they would, could use some extra involvement from an extra set of hands that had experience in behavior change procedures. Um, and there was one university in the St. Louis area that said they were interested, and I met with their director of sports performance who happened to be like a really data-driven sports scientist who was just kind of all about getting more information and uh, using science to improve his athlete's performance. And so uh, we uh, decided on a couple specific projects. So one was to target um, velocity during exercise routines. So basically, uh, when you're doing strength training and you're lifting a bar, you're doing that with, with a specific speed. And if you can increase the speed with which that bar is lifted, you can in, increase explosiveness, which has uh, obvious benefits for athletes. And so what we did was we, we found a system that uh, has sensors that attach to the barbells. Um, so when you're doing Olympic style lifts, you just attach it to that barbell. And as the athlete moves the bar through space and time, it tracks how quickly they're doing that along with the variety of other different metrics. Um, and so what we did was we took all 350 athletes that are involved in this athletic department and we had them start a baseline phase where we were tracking with the sensors, but we're providing no additional information to them. Um, we then uh, made sure we had stable baseline and we met with them and set goals for, okay, today, um, based on this amount of weight you're going to be lifting and your previous performance, here's the velocity we want you to shoot for today. Um, we stationed iPads right next to each of the lift stations and then we just flip them available so that they were available for the athletes to see. So they got basically, they got goal setting and in the moment biofeedback on their performance. Um, so basically as they're lifting, they're seeing, am I meeting my goal for the day or not? And what we saw was that, um, that generally athletes had a pretty stable baseline. When we implemented this intervention, we saw improvements. We saw them lifting the bars faster and we saw that those improvements were more significant for athletes that were out of season versus those that were in season. And what I mean by that is athletes that were in the midst of their sport were p- focusing a little bit more on practice and games and less so on strength training, whereas the athletes that were preparing for their season, which hadn't started yet, were really focusing on improving strength and, and explosiveness. And we saw more improvements in those athletes versus the ones that were in season. Um, and in doing this, we, we included both kind of this large group design that was at 350-plus group that's had a pre and a post. Um, but we also looked at single subject design stuff. So we had multiple baseline across athletes and multiple baselines across different lifts for each individual athlete. So I know that's a lot to throw at you, but, um, no. that was kind of what we saw. And, and we were in the, we were in the, in the middle of that feeling pretty good. Our data was looking great. And then again, COVID hit. So, uh, we're kind of using that as, as good pilot data to, uh, re-implement once if, and when, um, we're able to, to get back to, um, more traditional athletic training. Yeah, I can imagine a bunch of uh, athletes in a gym, you know, exhaling, 
you know, uh, forcefully Probably as they're the exercising. You know, that's going to take a little bit of time to hope. You know, hopefully not not too too much, but it will take some time to sort out when that will be a safe activity again. I think, sadly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that's that's fascinating stuff. So, um, w- was there a specific kind of cue or or uh, guidance, verbal guidance that you gave to the athletes? Did you just say basically, "Hey, lift the bar as fast as you can." Uh, or- yeah. So, in, so initially, that was that was the rule that we implemented was just like, "Here's the sensors, lift as fast as you can." That was kind of our baseline target. Um, and then prior to each session during our intervention. We said, okay, today, based on your your baseline performance and your um, the amount of weight that's on the bar, we want you to shoot for, you know, 0.7 meters per second. So we would actually sit down with them and say, here's your actual goal for today. And then the iPad sitting right in front of them will tell them, okay, that lift you did 0.6 seconds or 0.6 meters per second or 0.8 meters per second, and they can get that um, in the moment feedback so they know if they're actually meeting their goals or not. That's really neat. That kind of uh, live uh, live response. Did you? I don't know if you caught uh, the interview I did with uh, Neil Dioshand uh, a while ago, but he mm-hmm. rigged some. Uh, he rigged a punching bag or developed technology to to measure like uh, strike force. I don't. I, I you know if, Neil, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry. I'm not remembering this. Just kind of popped into my head, and so I don't have the terminology great, uh, d- uh, accurate probably. But yeah, it's, but it was another thing where where you know athletes get real time feedback and as it related to the specific pinpointed response that, that yeah, and there's, under there's, scrutiny. Yeah, and there's good data to, to show that um, if you get in-the-moment feedback versus like at the end of the week feedback, your, your real, real-time in-the-moment feedback is going to be more effective in changing behavior. And so that's a, the system that we found is really cool in, in that it does that. Um, it tracks your velocity, but also kind of like your movement. So if your form is really bad, it'll notify you of that. And it tracks data over time so that we can see, like I can filter it by individual athlete, by individual lift, individual weight and see, okay, over the last two weeks, are they improving or not? And, and then we can, again, using that single subject design, go in and intervene if we're having an issue. Like, are you fatigued? Are, is there a potential for injury? Um, do we, are, are we sitting down and, and setting these goals with you appropriately? Do we need to implement some kind of public posting or feedback? Um, so those are all things that we're, Again, kind of we're monitoring. We didn't get a chance to implement yet, but that um, we're kind of, again, part of the benefit of having that single subject design versus that group design. So I think that was that was an interesting one. Um, the next study we're working on uh, was looking at sports analytics. So I, this might get a little nerdy, so I'll, I'll oh, try yeah. to... Go right uh, ahead. You're in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to give mostly broad strokes. If, for those that are interested, we are working on a paper um, that will come out that will detail these a little bit more closely. Um yeah, if you want to know the, the nitty gritty of it, but, uh, broad strokes. So in basketball specifically, cause that's where I spent most of my time. Um, statistics are mostly determined by like what we call box score statistics. So that's like, if you used to read a newspaper, whenever newspapers were things, you would look at the box score and it would tell you how many points, rebounds and assists a, a player had in a given game. Right. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is taking that broad per game statistical information and quantifying it based on um, a, a, a more specific amount of time. So basically, if, in behavior analytic terms, instead of using count, we want to change it to ratio. So we want to know, instead of just for a game, how many points does an athlete have, we want to know for an average of 36 minutes, how many points would the athlete score? And that gives us more information about like how many points per minute are they scoring, how many rebounds per minute. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's it's better than a per game amount of information, but it's just different, right? So if, if you have an athlete that scored 10 points in 10 minutes versus an athlete that scored 10 points in 40 minutes, those just mean different things. They might be contributing different um, uh, different attributes to the team, right? And so one thing that we're doing is just taking that, just changing that simple count to a, a rate, and that's really informative for coaches that we're working with. Um, another thing that we're doing is looking at uh, changing more traditional field goal percentage to what we call true shooting or effective field goal percentage. So what that means is traditionally field goal percentages, uh, if you're a basketball player and you take 10 shots and you make five of them, your field goal percentage is 50%, right? You're making half of your shots. 
what true shooting percentage does is it, it, it actually sets value to the different points that are available for different shots in a basketball game. So if you're shooting 10 shots and making five of them, and they're all two-point shots, and I'm make, taking 10 shots and I'm making five of them, but they're all three-point shots, my shots actually have more value than yours, right? And so what true shooting percentage does is it actually takes that into account and, and weights my three-point shots as higher. And so you see that an, an athlete or a basketball player that's taking more three-point shots and making more three-point shots might have a more effective, a higher effective field who's not. So did I lose you with any of that? Or that no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm right there. with Yeah. It reminds me of uh, some of the work. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Brett Yaris. Um, no. Okay. Um, I'll put a link to this in the show notes. He did an interview on the controversial exchange with uh, with with uh, Ryan and Dimitri, and uh, Brett's company is doing some amazing sports analytics in the realm of uh, professional football, I believe. And they're doing it sounds like it's been a while since I listened to that show, but uh, they're doing some really amazing stuff as it relates to uh, some unconventional takes on analytics, much like in the same way you're doing, you know. And so they can they can basically value players. Or value their contributions in a in a much more uh, you know, detailed and efficient way, and it gives uh, coaches and you know uh, GMs etc. Uh, uh, better tools in which to evaluate what someone can contribute to the team and so forth. It's it's uh, real fascinating stuff. So that would be I, I think a good connection for uh, to make. Uh, so anyway, yeah, it sounds like and, and and Ben Taylor who has the the Thinking Basketball podcast. Um, does some similar so he's a behavioral scientist. I can't figure out exactly what that means. That's how he describes himself, but he's he's got like his own metrics that he includes that evaluate player performance, and um, he's really big on like what's your contribution to winning, right? And so um, he goes into some some pretty deep dives on um, on kind of like what is your actual value to a team, which is really interesting. Um, that is probably still over my head in terms of the the data analysis side of it. Um, but one interesting that, the thing that has come from the sports analytics side of things is that um, now that we can value or we can understand the value of different shots, right? So if, if you're shooting from different locations on the floor, um, certain shots are going to be more valuable than others. And that's led to kind of this three-point revolution where since three is worth more than two, we should take more three-point shots, right? Which sounds really straightforward and easy, but for the first, you know, uh, the, the three-point shot – came into the nba in 1979 and for the first like three decades no one really cared right so from uh, the whole decade of the 1980s uh if you took every single three-point shot taken for every single team and put them in a bucket that bucket would be more empty than one year of the houston rockets in in 2018 so basically the the houston rockets one team took more three-point shots in 2018 than the entire league took in a 10-year period Right, so wow. it's just show, showing this huge and I, why behavior. Can analysts you can you restate this. that again? So so a decade so in, of play in, in the NBA yeah. had fewer- and you put everybody combined everybody together, right? So the Houston Rockets in 2018 took more three point shots than every single team combined together took over a decade during the 1980s, right? That's and, incredible. And again, I, Sorry. Yeah, and yeah, and, and they because they're, they're one of the more analytically driven um, organizations. Their their general manager and president of of basketball operations is really he's started the MIT Sloan Conference, which is this big analytics conference. He's just a big numbers geek, and he's recruited players that have certain skill sets and and that do certain things, and then really changed the emphasis on play to to be driven by data, and and that was. What I was trying to get at is why behavior analysts should care about this is that it's data-based decision-making. It's data-changing behavior, right? It's, it's, okay, now that we can quantify this information, now that we understand what the data is telling us, we can actually change our behavior to more effectively perform. And I think that's a, a really important piece of, of understanding analytics and understanding sports performance is just like you, if you work by the numbers, you're going to win more. Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. 
Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. Wow. That's, that's, I'm still blown away by that, that statistic. That's crazy. Uh, I, had, I had to dig hard for that one. There were, there were a couple of funny ones, but I thought that one ended up being my favorite. Oh yeah, that is, that, yeah, that's mind blowing. So um anything else in the analytic side of 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 your work uh you want to mention before Um, we move on not the analytic side i do have one more that we're we're doing now which is my my dissertation which is looking at the behavioral economics of exercise in athletes and non-athletes um and so basically what we're doing is we're we're using uh hypothetical purchase tasks so demand surveys and delay discounting surveys and i i can go into more detail on what those are if you want me to. Um, but we're sending those out to both athletes in Division One programs and non-athletes in Division One programs and seeing if they value exercise differently um, and seeing if the if, if the, watching a short act video changes the way they value exercise. So um, that's kind of what we're looking at now, and we have some good pilot data on that. And, and so what's what's the hypothesis there that uh, they would value exercise more having connected with their values or whatever uh, act process that gets highlighted in the in the video? Yeah, so there'll be a couple different hypotheses. So one would be that athletes will value exercise more greatly than non-athletes, right? So if, if you're a Division one athlete, the hypothesis is that you value exercise more already. Um, and then... The second hypothesis is we're actually studying um, general exercise, so like weightlifting and cardiovascular exercise, comparing that to sports-specific exercise, so practice in games, right? So the idea would be that um, we think at least athletes will value their sports-specific exercise more than they'll value general exercise. And then the third hypothesis would be that uh, we think that watching this ACT video would um, – would ch- increase the way uh, increase the value of exercise for both athletes and non-athletes. And um, I know uh, Mark Mark Dixon has put out a study with one of his graduate students where they have shown that just like a brief mindfulness activity um, does increase the way people value di- different commodities and changes delayed discounting rates. Um, and there's there's actually quite a bit of research showing that mindfulness specifically can be an effective approach in. Uh, changing discounting rates, as can um, episodic future thinking, which is um, kind of a a specific technique, but it's basically a values-based exercise where you tell people to like specifically imagine what their future would look like given this set of circumstances. And so, based on those couple things, there's a, some of those nice act principles are built into um, those interventions. And so, we're kind of trying to combine them under that act umbrella and see if we get some some nice powerful change there. Wow, that's uh, that's really neat. Uh, again, is this something that was interrupted uh, by by COVID too? Or? No, this was act- so. Actually, my dissertation was supposed to be the first project I talked about with the, the velocity based training and biofeedback. COVID screwed that up, so we tried to move to more of a um, uh, a survey based assessment that could be done more quickly. So we're waiting for the athletes to come back so that we don't have funky results because of their in, uh, inability to access exercise equipment. But when they come back, we're going to pretty quickly get them the surveys so that we can um, get that all finished up pretty quickly. I see. I see. All right. so that, that, that one is still underway and it is going to be um, our pilot data looks good and we're going to be sending it out for the, the larger study here soon. Awesome. Really neat stuff. Um, 
I know you want to talk a little bit about uh, ABA and obesity and ABA nutrition. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about? Uh, let's. I guess we could start with obesity. Uh, for so. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I mean, I, again, I think as behavior analysts, we sometimes we're so focused on process um, that we lose sight of outcomes sometimes. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, I think it's important to understand. N- n- how behavioral processes contribute to larger outcomes. So exercise and nutrition are important processes, right? But the result of those behaviors, whether good or bad, or whether healthy or unhealthy, lead to this obesity piece, right? And um, basically, we're we're in the middle of of an obesity pandemic. We have over 70% of adults over the age of 20 are either overweight or obese, um, it's costing the United States about $150 billion a year just to treat um, obesity itself. Uh, over fi- Almost 50% of individuals with autism are overweight or obese. Um, all costs are higher for individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, and it's just – so it, it's, it's a problem for our country, and it's also a problem for the group of people that we work most closely with, right? And And – those are our cost and prevalence numbers, but it, like obviously the result of, of being overweight and obese is that uh, individuals have higher rates of cardiovascular disease and cancer and diabetes, and they, they don't live as long, and they can't live as fulfilling lives. And so there's all these like huge secondary difficulties that are experienced by these individuals because they're not getting the exercise they need, and they're not getting the nutri- or using the nutrition patterns that they probably need. Yeah, the, uh, um, the, the so, diseases of lifestyle sometimes I think I've heard it referred yeah. to as. Yeah, and so as, as behavior analysts, I think, I think we're uniquely positioned to treat those underlying behavior patterns. Um, and that's not to discount that things like hypothyroidism um, and, uh, you know, issues with leptin response, like those are all biological factors. Like that's not discounting those. But we are definitely uniquely positioned to impact those more behavioral factors. Um, and I, I, I think that, um, again, like you said, Matt Norman has been on your podcast. Um, I know there's some really good literature on exercise and nutrition, but it, I think as a field, it's something that we haven't quite um, really focused on as much as maybe we could. And I, I think a lot of people have interest in it, but aren't maybe going out and pursuing this kind of research and this kind of practice. And I would just love to see us doing more of that. Very cool, um, and and so I I know like you talked about the intervention you did for the the folks back in the group home, um, and do you see uh, you know how how does this relate to um, you know the the aspects of you know I get the exercise piece, uh, but in terms of the um, work that's been done in ABA uh, also in in the realm of nutrition, so uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I actually think that some of the the best behaviorally based um, nutrition research out there is done by uh, Leonard Epstein and his group, which um, they're out of the University of Buffalo. And he, like his first, some of his first research articles were published in JABA, and they looked at like uh, duration of meals, uh, so how fast people were eating. Um, but he's done a lot of like. Uh, his more research is looking. His more recent research is looking at things like uh, relative reinforcement value of food, right? So he's showing that like individuals that are overweight and obese will continue to work harder and harder and harder to access food, whereas healthy weight individuals are just like, well, this is it's not worth it, right? And so he's doing a lot of stuff looking at um, how behavior patterns are different for individuals that are overweight or, and obese. And this is like starting like really, really early. I think the last pu- paper I saw was like starting at like a, b- age two, maybe that they were already seeing these patterns emerging. Oh my. And yeah. And, and it's like all behavioral economically based. So they're doing a lot of um, really nice data analysis and they're getting really large uh, subject pools, but it's all, again, it's not just like, hey, here's the survey. How, do you think your kid eats too much? It's like, we're going to bring you into the lab and see if we present you with these sugary treats, like how hard will you work to, to access them? Or um, will you become satiated at different rates than a healthy weight individual? And they're really just like specifically assessing and testing those things. Um, so I think all that research is really cool. Um, I 
again, being a, a Carbondale student, I, uh, I'm very interested in the relational frame theory approach to, to all this. So there's, there's some really cool articles by, um, by Hausman um, and her group. Uh, and I know Sung Wu Kong was involved in that research as well, but they looked at, um, at teaching portion size estimation uh, for individuals using uh, a, a stimulus equivalence paradigm, basically. And so they, they taught college age and then uh, preschool age students, I believe, how to more accurately uh, dish out portions using a stimulus equivalence approach. Uh, and then Mark Dixon and, and colleagues looked at a uh, similar approach using stimulus equivalence to teach uh, college age students how to uh, categorize different fast food items based on caloric value. So they had like an under 500 calorie menu option between 500 and 1,000 and then 1,000 plus. And so they, they taught um, college students how to figure out, okay, if I give you a Big Mac, which of those three categories does this fall into? Um, and so I think that that stimulus equivalence and relational frame theory approach provides a lot. I mean, we've already established as a science that that it provides uh, a really efficient way to teach information. And I think using it to apply to the health education, nutrition education side of things um, would be really interesting. And that's a, I actually, I gave a presentation at the, the International Association for Contextual Behavior Science um, conference. Uh, I guess that was in July. And that was kind of the, the premise of that is that we have this great science for teaching information efficiently. Uh, we should really be using this on a, a broader and larger scale. Yeah, for sure. You know, and I think the you know one of the things that came out of my conver- you know a couple of my conversations with with Nick Green is that uh, you know you can exercise all you want, but you know I think the the saying or the adage that he used was that you know it's it's hard to outrun a bad diet. Uh, yeah. and so, you know, um, in terms of, you know, obviously I, I would imagine they have to go together hand in hand, but I think I've, you know, I've just, and I don't know if this is just kind of like, this is like, you know, kind of a pop research you hear just in, in, in just general media, but something like, you know, the, the, the proportion of, of influence that exercise has over weight loss is, is kind of depressingly small relative to, you know, your, your diet. You know, I always yeah, have these like things whenever they, I work out, it's like, oh man, I'm going to, I'm going to go have a burger and fries, you know, and it's like, well, you know, um, anyway, so. Yeah. And, and you, if you're not eating well, it's going to be hard to even to get a good exercise procedure in place too. Like I definitely noticed that, you know, if I'm, if I eat crappy the night before, my workout sucks, right? So, yeah. um, you know, they, they definitely have additive value and, uh, you know, are weighted probably differently also, for sure. I see, I see. Um, well, I, I, I think this conversation has really given us a, a, a broad view and it's certainly emblematic of the, the, I guess, the diversity of pursuits that you're following right now. So, uh, and I, I can guarantee uh, I'm going to get uh, lots of people reaching out to me trying to learn more about this. So, uh, before we wrap up here, um, you know, if people want to connect with you, uh, what would be a good place for them to find you? Are you uh, like on Twitter or are you, uh, you know, have a website that you want to mention or anything like that? Yeah, so I, I was actually talking to my wife about this last night. My, my social media game just really sucks. Um, so um, we, we have a Facebook page at Elite ABA, um, E-L-I-T-E-A-B-A, um, but it's not updated very consistently. I think the best way would be to go to our website, which is EliteABA.com. Um, and again, that's private practice. We provide a lot of different services, including this, this exercise and health and wellness program. Um, and, and our contact us page will just come directly to me so I can, can access all that information. So um, if anyone reach, wants to reach out, that's probably the best way. All right. Very good. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes, too, if you're listening to this while you're driving or on the treadmill, hopefully, or you know, doing something healthy, <laughs> walking your dog. Who, know, who knows? Um, so, um, uh, Brand, is there anything else that uh, we, we, we didn't mention in our, in our show prep here that you want to talk about um, this was b- before I ask you for some advice for the newly minted as our, as our parting question? No, I think that was it. All right. So, now, uh, so we've reached the point of the show where I generally ask, what advice would you have for the, for the newly minted BCBA? Yeah. So I think, I guess my biggest advice would be, to do what you love doing, right? So, and I, I know that sounds really corny and cliche, but what I mean by that is not just like you'll be happier doing what you love, but also that you're going to be more passionate about it and that you already have 
you have the skills or you're learning the skills to do what you're excited about, right? So um, I think behavior analysts, we get kind of like stuck in why well, I have to do what Cooper says, or I have to follow this exact procedure, or everyone I know works in autism. And those things are all great and they're all fine. Um, but those behavioral principles are going to be relevant to doing whatever you're really interested in. If you want to be an administrator, um, you can use principles of organizational behavior management, right, to, to really improve uh, the performance of your staff. If, if you're interested in sports, like these principles apply there. If you're interested in some sort of, um, you know, educational pursuit outside, like anything you want to do, like you have the foundation for that. Um, that being said, I, I do think that sometimes we get a little cocky and a little over our skis on saying like, we know how to do everything best. So I think it's also important, like what I learned from this experience working within this, um, the sports science world, it's like I'm having to learn a whole new science to actually effectively implement behavior change, right? So I, the way I approached it was, hey, I can help you with behavior change. You got to help me with understanding what you want to change and why, right? So I, I think the two things I would say would, would be like to do what you're excited about and to be open-minded to learn from people that have different experiences. Because, I, I, again, I think as behavior analysts, sometimes we feel like we can do all this stuff. And I, I think we have the foundation for it, but that we also have to be willing to learn and accept what other people have out there too. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of the content knowledge is uh, is uh, certainly key. So yeah, uh, great advice for the newly minted. So Brendan May, this has been great. Um, I could probably talk a lot more about all sorts of stuff, but I think we managed to uh, avoid going down any serious rabbit holes. But uh, uh, that being said, thanks for joining me today on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Matt. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.